After this, the author, he went on to the next section, and that is the chapter of Mawarith, i.e. the laws of inheritance. If a person dies, how do we react? So the first obligation upon us with regards to the deceased is that we have to prepare his burial and his shrouding and his transport to the graveyard. However, the cost of this has to be moderate according to your setting which you are in. So neither do we go to the extreme of being extravagant and neither should we be stingy. So for example, if there is uh, the, the average price or the average cost of preparing for the burial is 100 pounds and then there's another company which is offering a more extravagant service for a thousand pounds and the body is going to be carried or transported in a Cadillac or a Ford, this is not permitted. So after we have paid off the costs for the burial and the funeral procession for the deceased, then the next step is that we have to pay off the debts of the deceased. Min malihi. We're talking now about the inheritance or the wealth which the deceased person has left behind. What do we have to do? From his wealth, the first thing which has to pay, be paid off are the funeral costs. The second thing that has to be paid off from his money or his wealth are the debts which he owes to people. And also, some of the debts which he obligated upon himself, which were a kafara or an expiation which he owed. These have to also be paid from his wealth. And then after this, if the deceased had left behind a wasiyah, a bequest, then that bequest has to be executed and that wealth has to be deducted from his inheritance. However, the deceased person cannot leave behind a wasiya, a bequest, except that it has to be a third or less than a third. Meaning, he is not allowed to bequest more than a third of his wealth. It can only be a third or less than a third. And secondly, he is not allowed to leave behind a wasiya for an heir who inherits from his wealth. If the deceased had requested in his will for him to be buried inside the masjid, the will is not executed. If he had requested in his will for anything which was haram, it cannot be executed. And then after this, after paying off these things, then we distribute the inheritance. And nowadays, it's prevalent, the practice which is prevalent, that if the deceased leaves behind a house, he leaves it behind for his wife and his youngest child. And this is something which is not permitted. Rather, we have to distribute the inheritance according to the laws which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And the majority of problems nowadays between family members is because of inheritance. So as we mentioned, if a person passes away and leaves behind, and leaves behind wealth, then these four steps in this sequence, have, the wealth has to be deducted. Firstly, we deduct from his wealth the amount which is required for his funeral procession, the burial, the transport, and everything which is associated from it. Secondly, we have to pay off his debts. And these are his debts towards other people and also his debts with Allah, like the Sheikh mentioned, kafar and expiations and, and nadur and so on and so forth. And then the third step is if he left behind a wasiyah, a bequest, which does not contain haram, this has to also be executed. And then after this is the fourth step, and that is for the wealth to be distributed according to the laws of inheritance. If you want to write your will, and you want to leave behind a wasiyah, a bequest, then what, you sh what should you write in your wasiyah? First of all, if you know that when you pass away, your family members who remain, that they are going to be carrying out bid'ah innovations after you have passed away, then you should write this down in your wasiyah. And you tell them and you advise them not to partake in these bid'ah or these innovations. And this is how things have to be done and that you are free from any type of bid'ah. Then after this, the author went on to the next chapter. And that is that after a person has uh, bought and sold and traded and then he wants to get married, the rulings of nikah. Now look, as soon as marriage is mentioned, everybody's sitting upright, nobody's looking at their phones anymore. Yeah. And he said, if only the whole Dora was regarding nikah. After yeah. nikah, there'll be divorce. A student of knowledge, or students of knowledge, how should they behave? 
if we are students of knowledge and we are people of the sunnah, then our gatherings should be as such. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, keep our gatherings. And the ulama, and this isn't my speech, but this is the statement of the ulama, they say that our gatherings should be free from the mention of that which stirs the desires of the private parts. And also, for example, the mention of women and uh, talking too much about dunya and food and mobiles and things like this. These, our gatherings should not be gatherings which are based upon this because our gatherings are the gatherings of the sunnah and the gatherings of a salafiyya. And if a person entered into the masjid and he saw and he listened from your gathering and all you're talking about is women and desires, he'll say, this is salafiyya, this is the sunnah. And the Sheikh mentioned that the gatherings of Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, if a person was to enter upon the gathering, straight away would remind them of the Akhirah. Because these were the gatherings of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, always regarding the Akhirah. There was no mention of the dunya in his lessons and his gatherings. And it was never heard from the gatherings of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah slandering or backbiting. So, if a person is able to marry, then he should depend upon Allah and he should marry. But if a person is unable to marry, how should he behave? He should fast. And this was the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ, that a person fasts if he's unable to get married. Not that he continuously talks about marriage. And also that a person reduces the amount of food and drink he consumes. Meaning half a meal in a day. And this is the guidance of the Sharia in terms of fasting. And also in terms of reducing your food and drink so it doesn't stir or strengthen your desire and your, and your emotions. And then another piece of advice is that for those brothers who are not married, that abstain from your phones or have a phone which doesn't have these features. And also, even if you do possess such a phone, then those programs and those apps which you know are going to cause you problems, you should delete them. Not merely block them, but delete them. So maybe on WhatsApp, for example, if you know that there's a particular individual and he sends you certain messages which are not good, you can block that person. But you know that there are other apps which bring much afflictions and calamities and fitna for a person. You delete them from your phone. And, you should, and you should be completely confident that whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will give him that which is better than it. And also that a person makes dua. And also... A person makes dua and you say, Oh Allah, suffice me from that which you have made halal away from that which you have made haram. And oh Allah, suffice, oh Allah, uh, make my dependence and reliance upon you and do not leave me to my own self even for the blinking of an eye. And look at the example of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam and when he feared the plot of the women and how he sought refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much so he said oh my lord prison is more preferred to me than that which they call to and this was Nabiullah Yusuf alayhi salam and he preferred to be imprisoned than to be taken by the plots and the seductions of those women now a person who is not married he should not isolate himself from the rest of the people because this is one of the plots of a shaitan isolating yourself and being alone and spending a lot, of the, a lot of time in the hammam, these are from the plots of a shaitan. And even opening your laptop or entering onto the sites in a place in which you are isolated from the people. Yeah. And also, stay away from the town centers and the marketplaces. And also staying away from these malls and supermarkets. Meaning a person should not go to those places where there is fitna. And he should also lower his gaze and control. And also he should accompany righteous people. Because no. if he is sitting with a righteous person, he will not look at that which is haram. But if he is with a sinner, then that sinner will encourage him to look at that which is haram. So there are some people who have problems within themselves in how they deal with the attractions or how they deal with the fitan around them. And sometimes they approach a person who is not affected by these fitan and they become a cause for him being tested by these fitan. 
And Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentioned that some people with the excuse of trying to forbid evil, they actually end up spreading evil. And how is this? That a person will say and he will detail that here Makan. at the back of the masjid there's a place. <laughs> so a person will mention and detail that in our town there's a particular place and everything that you desire you can find it there. A'udhu billah. And because of that person mentioning this place of evil in which everything is available, thinking that he's trying to remove the evil and forbid the evil, he has actually made this evil more prevalent and attracted people to it. If there is a place of evil like this, then how do you respond? You go to the relevant authorities, you go to the police, you go to the state, you inform them, you try to get that evil changed. As for mentioning it to every person, then per that person becomes af affected by these places. And, and this was the advice of Sheikh Sam Taymiyyah rahimullah, that you should not speak about these matters. Yani, you should not broadcast these matters. So we mentioned that if there is a person who is able to get married, he should get married. And if there is a person who is not able to get married, then take these steps to protect yourself. So for example, come and frequent the masjid and remain in the masjid throughout the day. And also, don't go to sleep except that you're extremely tired such that as soon as you get into bed, you're going to fall asleep. A person prays Qiyam al-Layl and he supplicates to Allah. Or for example, a person runs and even if he runs 10 kilometers. But the problem nowadays is that a person, he intentionally does everything opposite to what we have advised. And then after this, he says, look at the fitna around us. And a person, if he's good and pure and clean within himself, then Allah will bestow upon him a wife who is similar in nature. Because Allah subhanahu said in the Quran, the meaning of which is that the good pure women are for the good pure men, and the good pure men are for the good pure women. Shafi'i rahimahullah yaqul. And, and also Allah subhanahu mentioned the meaning of which is that just as you are, then you will be repaid by those who are in authority over you. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimullah, he said, uh, Al-Imam al-Shafi'i rahimullah said, and may Allah protect me and you, he said that a zina, adultery, is like a debt which has to be repaid. Meaning, if a person is going to violate the honor of other people, then this is a debt. And that debt will be repaid by other people violating his honor. So with regards to marriage, then a man should choose a woman who possesses uh, any religion, taqwa, and good manners. And also, he should marry a woman uh, and who will bestow upon him offspring. And this can be done by looking at her family or her mother. And, and also, when it comes to marriage and finding a suitable partner, that this is done in the manner which is correct. So he doesn't send her private WhatsApp messages or meet her in the coffee shops. And now, with regards to the pillars of nikah, what are they? Firstly, the husband, meaning the groom, and the wife or the bride, and then the male guardian of the woman, and then two witnesses. Uh, some people, they ask me, I approached the father of the woman, and I proposed to her, and then after this, the father of the girl, he did not agree. And my reply is that the wali, the male guardian of the woman, he has to agree because this is a rukun, this is a fundamental pillar of the nikah. But if he says that he's a non-Muslim and he does not pray, is it only now he became a non-Muslim? Only because he did not accept your proposal? The only reason why now he has all of a sudden decided that her father is a non-Muslim because he doesn't pray salah, because he wants to abolish his guardianship over her. And this is how people work nowadays. So if he says the father is a non-Muslim because he doesn't pray, well, how did you react? He says, well, then I went to her brother and I proposed and even her brother rejected the proposal. Then I found out that he's also non-Muslim. And then what did he do? And then he said, I approached somebody walking on the street. Come over here. Become the wali of this woman and marry her off to me. And he says, look, it's permitted for you to be the wali, just marry her off. And he says, khalas, I give you my permission. And then he married her. And then after this, there was a divorce. And now the woman doesn't have a wali. So it isn't done in this manner, meaning any person can become a wali. Because this is the sharia. And this nikah, 
this nikah can only be done with the express permission of the wali and that the aqd or the contract it is recorded he said no i don't want to record the uh, the the contract because you don't know how the system works here let's say you don't know the system here because if i was to register the marriage every day she'll be threatening me that if you do something to me half of the house half of the wealth it's all mine but whoever fears allah allah will make an opening for him and nowadays the statistics are showing us that many young people they are reaching 34 years and they are not married so anyway we mentioned the arkan or the pillars of a nikah and this is sufficient so rajim the pillars of the nikah arkan arkan nikah no. uh, so the pillars of the nikah are the bride so with regards to the pillars of the nikah then it's, it is firstly a proposal from the man and then the acceptance from the woman and her wali and then the presence of the two witnesses and that this is something which is recorded and then after then after this a person marries and then after marriage he said to his wife prepare tea for me and she says no i'm not going to prepare tea and he says that you are disobedient this isn't the case it's not the case that any refusal from a wife comes under any disobedience no shoes and then he divorces her immediately some of the ulama mention some of the ulama mention that at-talaq divorce is like a bullet And نعم. once you have shot the bullet, it will not return. So how or when? How or when should a divorce happen? Who knows the married people? So firstly, when it comes to divorce, we have to understand the grounds upon which a divorce should be made, and this is a nushuz, and there's an Islamic meaning behind the term a nushuz, and it is complete disobedience, complete refusal. to fulfill his rights this is no shoes as for something here and some refusal over there like for example i'm not going to make that tea for you this isn't valid grounds for there to be a divorce and you now thinking that she is completely evil and she is disobedient and she refuses to fulfill my right if she's not making tea for you there's a coffee shop over there go buy some tea and drink it and don't make a problem in your marriage uh, one of the married people said to me if i say to my wife prepare something for me and she does not do so then how should i i advised him that don't argue with her and how you should react to this is have a shower put on your best clothes nice perfume and leave the house for half an hour by the time you return everything will be prepared for you because she's thinking that you've gone to now a a young brother from france he approached me and he said to me that the problem in our household is that my wife doesn't argue with me in the daytime but when it's time to sleep and i'm tired and i've got work the next day and you know in europe you can't even be late for a second when it comes to work and i'm just about to go to sleep and put my head on the bed then this is when she begins arguing with me and so every night she begins to argue with me and i divorce her and then the next night when the night time comes and i'm tired and i need to sleep and i'm about to sleep and she begins argumentation i divorce her and then i said to i said to him did you divorce and he said yes how many times have you divorced <laughs> many many times so the point is that you asked this uh, she asked this person so how many times have you divorced her and he says many many times i'm always divorcing every night i divorce her why because i'm not thinking straight and so it doesn't apply and the sheikh replies you are not mature enough to marry so send me your male guardian and i'll speak to him why is it that the right to divorce has been pla- placed in the hands of the husband so solving the reconciling between husband and wife when they have their problems how is it conducted firstly not every small situation should be made out to be a problem when you enter your house firstly say the dua for entering the house mention the name of allah so firstly don't make every situation into a problem so if you know that if you by you going into the kitchen you're going to end up arguing and checking and making comments don't enter into the kitchen what's the kitchen got to do with you it's not like it's your library your library is in your masjid so don't as long as there's nothing haram which is going on and as the saying goes overlooking matters this is a half of haya now يعني ignoring matters is half of haya but if there is a real problem 
and there is complete disobedience and complete refusal from the wife, then how should I react? Who amongst the married can give me an answer? So if there is complete refusal and complete disobedience from her, the first step is to advise her, remind her, admonish her. And how does he admonish her? <laughs> so is admonishing her, threatening her with taking all the children and taking the passports and taking all her papers such that she's going to remain in the country like a refugee? Is this admonishing her? No, this is threatening. No, rather, when you give a wa'ad, a reminder, an admonishment, how is it? He says, buy for her a gift. Now, you buy a gift and you send a message with a big red heart, love heart, and then you write sweet words to her and you say, oh, my precious wife, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa advised me to be good to you and advised you to be good to me, so fulfill your rights. Because you want from her to return back to you and to be good to you and live with you in, in an appropriate manner. You don't want her to disobey you even further. So, so admonishing and correcting and rectifying the marriage, it's important. So if she says that, okay, I repent to Allah, then what do you say to her? Ah. If she is sorrowful and she says, okay, I repent and I'm sorry, then how should you behave? Do you say to her, no? It's not that easy. I need to teach you the lesson. Don't you remember yesterday you did this and this and this? No, not like this. It's like Allah subhanahu wa mentioned in the Quran that if they return to your obedience, then the Shaykh said that don't keep that file opened. Close that file because each time if she says sorry and she returns back and you say, but I need to teach that lesson. And do you remember what you did the other day? Then this is going to be a continuation of those problems. But if she does not react in a manner which is appropriate and she remains completely disobedient and refusing, then you throw the present to her. So you, you throw the, she throws it back to you and she says to you, you've got no style and no taste in buying gifts. Anyway, so he replies and he says, look, my taste is good because I chose you. Anyway, if she doesn't return and it's complete refusal and complete disobedience, so how should we behave? We say that the next step after trying to admonish her is to be distanced from her. And how does he be distanced from her? And that is for now. three days, he refuses to speak to her. And then after three days, he greets her. And also in terms of sleeping, he also, and he stays away from her. And this means that he can sleep in the same bed, but gives her his back. So he doesn't need to go and sleep on the couch in a different room. Now, if she's sorrowful and regretful and she repents, again, the file is closed. But if she carries on with her disobedience and a complete refusal, some people think that Islam, it calls to beating the women and leaving marks on them. And Islam is free from this. The Prophet ﷺ, he never hit a slave or a servant, never mind a woman. It's not possible. It's not possible that the religion of Islam contains an encouragement to beat or hurt women and leave marks upon them. And here is in front of you the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and the lives of the Sahaba. And then after this stage, he does not hit a woman and leave marks on her. So after this, what does the person do? Okay, the next step of reconciling a problem between the husband and the wife, what is it? Is that a, a male from her family and a man also from his family, both of them are chosen. And also these two people who are going to come forward and try to reconcile between them, they intention should, should be to find out the root of the problem and try to solve the problem and bring them together. So you don't choose a person who's not very intelligent and he's going to cause further problems and he wants to her to be divorced. And yeah. also a person who is intelligent enough that he understands the situation. So for example, if his wife does not pray, he says, no, she has to pray. Or if the man, he's drinking alcohol or smoking or taking intoxicants, then he says, no, this is valid enough for a divorce. Yeah. But if her complaint is that my, hus my husband hasn't bought me for me a particular garment, then these intelligent people... They try to solve the issue. They say, okay, I'll buy you a piece of garment and just keep together, stay together, solve your problem. And when the issues are resolved, then the file, the file is closed. After this, what do we do? And if after all of these steps that a person takes, 
and there are still problems and there's refusal and there's disobedience and the rights are not being fulfilled, then the fifth and final step is divorce. And how does he divorce? Is it that a person says to his wife that I divorce you a million, million times? Is it correct? Firstly, he's only allowed to say the divorce in a, in a state of her purity in which they have, had not, uh, they have not had relations. And he is not permitted to exile her or exit her from the house. And he, and he is still responsible for maintaining her. And also, the husband, he should also remain in the house as well. So he maintains her and does, he does not throw her out of the house. And neither does he himself also abandon the house. And shaitan, and there are many different shayateen, the whole focus of the shaitan and the one who is most beloved to the shaitan is that person who tries to separate between husband and wife, or separate between people. Yeah.